Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Peter Gaiman, Professor of Old Testament and Biblical Languages at Shepherd Seminary. This podcast is dedicated to discussing issues related to scripture and theology. For more information, visit petergaiman.com. Well, a hearty salutation to you wherever and whenever you are listening to this episode. It's good to be with you. I've just completed the first week of classes at Shepherd's Theological Seminary. It's been a great experience. We've had a lot of new students and a lot of uh, returning students, which I'm thrilled to be back in class with again. And actually, this episode kind of comes out of one of the class experiences that I had this week. We were talking in class about why do we have the Bible or what is the purpose of Scripture? I think that's a really important question. And I think it deserves a little more extended answer. So I wanted to give some thoughts on why we have the Bible or what the purpose of the Bible is. And the answer really will kind of dovetail into a much broader topic, which I think it's very much worth our time spending some of our minutes thinking through these issues. So what is the purpose of the Bible? So I decided to consult DuckDuckGo because that's you know, the search engine that's, that Christians use now. So I, I searched, why did God give us the Bible? Okay, so that's why I, I, or that's what I searched on the search engine. And BibleAsk.org was the first response, okay? And this is the first paragraph of their of their lead. And it says this, God gave us the Bible to tell us the story of his infinite love and redemption for man. The Lord inspired holy men to write down his sacred truths. The human authors wrote exactly what God wanted them to write, and the result was the perfect holy word of God. Okay, no qualms about uh, the end part there, about obviously the Lord did inspire his word, and we have that in perfection. But did God give us the Bible to tell us the story of his infinite love and redemption for man? Now, this is this is where... I'm going to push back just a little bit. But before I do that, I want to just even share, as I was growing up, many of the churches and speakers that I heard uh, speak or preach would would often use this phrase. And it's one of those things that I think really needs to be put to rest. I'm not not a big fan of it. Uh, I guess the illustration can be used in an appropriate way. But the, the illustration was that God's word is his love letter to us. It's his love letter to tell us how much he loves us and the way that he's provided for salvation, etc. And the issue with this is that this is a very man-centered approach to scripture. And I, I would propose a different way of thinking about it. And then I'm going to defend such things and, you know, give us some food for thought. But I think that there is a problem if we make the Bible man-centered, if it's, if it's about, God telling us how much he loves us or how much he wants to be with us or if he wants us in heaven with him. In fact, I, well, there's, there's actually a group, uh, some of you may have heard of it, Hillsong, uh, don't really recommend their music, but they have a lot of really popular songs. And one of their songs, which is quite popular is, I think it's called like, what a wonderful name or something like that. And it's got some very catchy lyrics and a, and a good chorus, but the verse just drives me crazy. And th- this is what, uh, the, I think it's the second verse. It says, you didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. And I just, each time I see that I, I cringe because is that really what was going on? Did, was God discontent, uh, was heaven inferior without us? He, he God decided that, heaven, you know, we were worth having in in heaven. Is that really what the Bible is about? Now, I'm not saying everybody is embracing Hillsong theology or anything like that, but I think it's, it's perhaps a misperception that, that God was lonely or that he needed us or anything like that. That's the Bible does not give any indication of that. But even beyond that, I think many of us fall into into the pattern of thinking that the Bible is maybe God's self-help manual to us. Now, we don't necessarily call it that all the time, but that's how we treat it. A lot of times we think of scripture as, okay, let's, let's just crack it open and, and get some, get some understanding about how we can change our personal oil in our life or whatever. 
And I'm not saying that the Bible doesn't give real valuable help. Okay, it does. Absolutely. But understanding the whole scripture and the entirety of the story is so crucial. Absolutely crucial. And so I, I want to challenge us. Is the Bible about us? Is, is, is that really a key focus of scripture? And I, I would submit to you that the Bible is all and only about God. Now, are we included in, in that story? Of course, we are a major part of that. But let's not confuse in any sense the protagonist, the main character, the hero of the story is God and God alone. And Genesis 1-1 is obviously a great starting point for that because it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The story starts in Genesis 1-1 and it's about God. That's who it's about. And humans are creatures, as Genesis 1 and 2 begin to make very clear. God created humanity, and so the purpose of humanity is built into the framework of creation. We are creatures, and that is an incredible privilege to be a creature of the Almighty Creator. But at the same time, we are not to think of ourselves as more than that. And so that's where a lot of times we get into trouble because we tend to overvalue ourselves with regard to uh, our role in creation. But, but this is important to keep in perspective who God is and who we are. Now, somebody might say and you know push back and say, well, isn't the Bible about God saving us? Can't we say that it's God's love letter saying about you know how he's made this way of salvation or whatever? Yeah, well, there is. And I always say this, is that obviously God's salvation of humanity is the centerpiece to the story, but it's not the entire story. There's much more to it. There is a king and a kingdom and a redeemed cosmos. So it's not just about a people that are saved and brought to a spiritual heaven and they're sitting on clouds and playing harps or whatever. Uh, That is often how we allow Hollywood to influence our thinking about what the goal of being in heaven is, what the goal of being saved. Oh, at least you're not in hell where you're in fire and torture all the time. At least you get to sit on the clouds and play a harp. You know, that's nice. But that's not what the Bible pictures. The Bible pictures a great and glorious God who is working toward the end of glorifying himself. Okay. And that is the key of scripture then. If, if someone asks me, what is the Bible about? Or if somebody even asks me, why are we here? The reason we are here on this earth, the reason the Bible has been given by God to us is to glorify him. It's, it's to point us to that reality, to glorify him. Now, I want to kind of prove that or solidify that by talking about God's glory and just how scripture is filled with this theme. This has been the reality uh, for many countless Christians. They've, they've recognized that our role in life is to glorify God. And when we do realize that, there is a tremendous freeing aspect in life because we function as God has designed us and we really we are happier. Now, obviously, happiness is not the uh, chief end of man. But to glorify God is is the chief end of man. So I want to talk about how scripture describes God's glory and the importance of it. And just even how it's ubiquitous throughout the Old Testament. It's it's ever present. So maybe the first principle to to understand is that uh, throughout scripture, uh, especially in the Psalms, you have creation itself declaring God's glory. You could include uh, creation. You could include the heavenly beings. Uh, this this is something that, that is a typical psalmic theme that creation is declaring God's glory. Psalm 19.1 is maybe the greatest example of that, where the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaim his handiwork. So anytime you look at creation, the stars themselves are a great example of this. You see God's handiwork and you understand how awesome God is. His, his glory is revealed. Uh, the impact, the weighty nature of who he is as a person, his reputation is furthered. And I remember being a youngster. And one of the things 
that I would do at night oftentimes was I would just lay in the grass and look up at the stars. I lived in northern Minnesota, and so there were not lights of major cities nearby blocking out the the light of the stars, and it was fantastic. And I remember even when we'd go camping, just looking at the stars and being amazed and just in wonder at, at how marvelous and amazing everything looked. Uh, it, it, it is an amazing privilege to be able to see and, and filter those things, understanding that it's, it's a representation and a testimony of who God is because he created those things. And it really is a remarkable privilege to be a part of that. But notice also as scripture carries on this theme of creation, that one of the marks of rebellious, foolish, sinful man is that he will often reject the glory of God as it relates to creation. And of course, Romans 1 is perhaps the best illustration of this. In Romans 1, we're told that mankind suppresses the truth about God in unrighteousness, Romans 1.18. And then in verse 21, it says, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. That's That uh, language there is basically copy pasted from Genesis one, the Septuagint. Uh, those are, those are descriptions of what God created in Genesis one. And then later on in verse uh, 25, it says they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So Romans one is really hitting this theme of, of creator versus creature, this theme very, very uh, significantly here. And it says, it's the epitome of foolishness. They claim to be wise, but they were actually fools when they exchanged the true glory of God as it's revealed in creation and his design for creation. And they exchanged that and they said, we don't want that. We want our own version of reality. And so they worshiped the creature and the creation rather than the actual glorious manifestation of creation that God had given. God alone is worthy of of worship, and so they they had uh, replaced the Creator with creation, and so Romans one talks about them denying that, exchanging that glory of God, and then, so of course that is the epitome of foolishness. That is a mark of rebellion, where you you ignore the glory of God in creation, and you do your own thing. You worship uh, creation. You worship your own way of uh, organizing reality and ordering that. And, and Paul speaks very strongly against that reality. Now, that's obviously a very important starting point is that even within creation, beginning in Genesis 1, you have all of creation declaring God's glory. Everything that he does, he designs for his glory. And one of the things that the Old Testament is very clear about is that God's glory is unique. It's not something that he shares with others. And I think this is one of my favorite parts of Isaiah. If, if, if you trace kind of some of the arguments that, that are, Isaiah is bringing out in his prophetic oracles, in Isaiah 42, 8, this really eye-popping verse shows up. And this is the Lord speaking through the prophet Isaiah. He says, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. I, I just think that is a phenomenal statement. My glory, I give to no other. God doesn't share. He, he's not willing to say, well, I don't need all the credit. I don't need all the glory for these actions. No, this is something that the Lord deserves and he won't share it. God deserves all the credit, all the glory. Later on in Isaiah 40, uh, 48 uh, verses 9 to 11, he, he talks about how how he is is going to uh, refine Israel because of their sin and punish them. So he says in verse 9, For my name's sake I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. 
Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver, and I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. And so, so in other words, he's saying, I, I've, I've punished you, but I haven't, I haven't, you know, completely annihilated you, but I've punished you. I've refined you in the furnace of affliction. And then notice why he says it in verse 11, for my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. No, it, it's actually repeated in the text. I'm not just repeating that it's twice. He says, for my own sake, I do it for how should my name be profaned? My glory, I will not give to another. That's Isaiah 42. So, so you ask the question, why does God do what he does? Well, he does it because he wants to glorify himself. That's why he does it. And he doesn't want to share that glory with anybody. You know, I remember a long time ago reading a book, uh, The Godly Man's Picture, I think was the name of it. And it was written by a Puritan, Thomas Watson. Uh, I was actually sitting on a airplane with somebody who I found found out was a believer. It was uh, a very providential appointment. And so I, uh, in talking to them, asked them what some of their favorite books were, just wanting to learn. And they recommended that one. And I read it. And phenomenal. Uh, really, really encouraging. Uh, really convicting. And I found some very, very helpful, life-changing stuff in there. And when I read it, I, I read this this part where Thomas Watson was talking about God's glory and the pursuit. And of course, the Puritans and, and many of many of the Christians during that time really had a good understanding of this. And one of the things that Thomas Watson said in the book was, and this was kind of his his ramblings and, and thought patterns on this was, I wonder how many people God has killed in order to remove them from from the picture so that God can receive all the glory. And the context was he was even talking about pastors or or Christians who were who were working faithfully uh, to the Lord, but they they themselves either were not sharing the glory or others were were, glorifying them too much. And, and I thought of that and I was thinking to myself, wow, that's, that's a good point there. This is something that we as Christians sometimes do when we idolize one another, you know, the celebrity pastor syndrome. Sometimes we give mere men glory, which is due only to God alone. Now, at the same time, uh, we, understand that there can be an individual who is who is very humble trying to give God all the glory and we when we look at them can can respond wrongly and we can in our own hearts attribute them glory that they do not deserve that only belongs to God so we can do that certainly but it is interesting and when I was reading that in in the book of Thomas Watson I, I remember thinking to myself this is this is a serious enterprise God is very serious about achieving his maximum amount of glory and rightfully so because he and he alone is the only one who is worthy of glory and of course there are there are multiple biblical illustrations of this maybe my my top two the favorite ones that I think about would be Daniel 4 Daniel 4 would be an excellent one. You have Nebuchadnezzar there, and Nebuchadnezzar is saying, oh, look at what I've done with you know mighty Babylon, the city that I have created. I have done this. And, and of course, knowing the his history, uh, the city of Babylon had the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the wonders of the ancient world. Of course, this was phenomenal. And of course, the region there uh, being very beautiful. Uh, they were the capital of the world. Babylon was such a such a powerhouse with regard to their military might. All of these elements were just incredible. And so Nebuchadnezzar is saying, look what I've done. I, 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 I. He's, he's the eye monster, right? And so he's saying all that. And the scripture says, before he finished speaking, while the words were still in his mouth, a voice came from heaven. And Nebuchadnezzar was duly chastened. And God says, you will spend seven years of your life uh, basically eating grass like an animal until you learn that I am the powerful God who gives the kingdom of men to whomever he will. Like this is the power of God and this is what you must learn, Nebuchadnezzar. And so it is an incredible passage, an incredible illustration of the fact that God really doesn't uh, play around with that kind of understanding. And perhaps an even greater illustration of that would be Acts 12. In Acts 12, we have uh, Herod and 
The people were shouting to him and he had just given a, a great or, oration. And so the people shout and say, the voice of a God and not of a man. And verse 23 of Acts 12 says, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down. And then we are given the reason because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Sounds like a great way to go. But notice the causal statement there. He was struck down because he did not give God the glory. This is a really interesting theme. And if you have not thought about this before, you really need to, is that all of life is pictured and geared toward the glory of God. This is the overall theme of scripture. This is why scripture exists to teach us to glorify God. And there are many people in scripture who we can learn from their negative example, like Herod, where we understand that they did not glorify God. So it's really important to recognize that God's glory is unique and he is the only one who has ever existed and will ever exist where he deserves every ounce of glory possible because that is who he is. He is the creator God who makes all things possible. So that's a really, really foundational aspect. But there are other things in scripture that, that point to this reality that we would be wise to consider as well. Obviously, on this podcast, we've talked about the future of Israel from time to time. Being a dispensationalist, I think that that's an important thing to talk about because scripture talks about that. But one of the key components, which is often minimized in talking about this, especially by those who aren't dispensationalists, is that scripture talks about the reason God interacts with Israel and the reason God is going to restore Israel is for his glory. And scripture is clear about that. Starting off in Isaiah 43, we've referenced Isaiah a few times, and Isaiah is very, very much thematically imbibed with this idea of God's glory. In fact, Isaiah 6, holy, 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 the whole earth is filled with his glory. So, of course, Isaiah is filled with this. But in Isaiah 43, it says, I will, I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. So it's talking about a restoration of Israel here. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and I made. Isaiah 43 is, is all about the servant that uh, Jacob the servant Israel here, uh, Jacob in Isaiah, sometimes you have a servant reference to Israel and sometimes you have a servant reference to the Messiah in Isaiah. They, they correspond back and forth sometimes. And here we're talking about Israel. And so they're specifically said, God is saying here, I created for my glory. So I formed this nation for my glory. And so Israel being formed for God's glory has application to us, certainly. Uh, we are not the new Israel. I would not argue that. But I would say that it's it's the way God operates. He, he forms and selects people to glorify himself. So salvation, that would apply in the same regard, is that God saves individuals to glorify himself. That That is a biblical principle. But moving on to other prophets, you see this theme exemplified even more. So Ezekiel 36 is probably one of the best places to see this. Ezekiel 36 is right up there with Jeremiah 33, one of the greatest passages on the new covenant, the exposition of the new covenant. And right before talking about how the Lord will give give a new heart uh, instead of a heart of stone. It will be a heart of flesh and my spirit will dwell within them. Right before that amazing passage in verse 22, it says, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name. So not for you. It's not for your benefit. It's for my benefit for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. And this is such a key theme to recognize and, and really 
I, I feel like only dispensationalists get this. I mean, there are probably exceptions to this, but I've in, in reading and thinking through a lot of the post millennialists, for example, uh, I was re- reading through David Chilton's book uh, the other day on post millennialism. And one of the key themes that he brought out was that Israel's been rejected. Israel's been rejected. Israel's been rejected. And the, the idea of Israel being rejected as God's special chosen people is really a slight on God ultimately because God chose Israel as a nation and they failed. And so they brought great disdain upon God. They really did because they, they failed him. They were, they were representatives of him. And so they failed. And so then God has to go to plan B. That doesn't make any sense. Rather, what God is saying in Ezekiel 36, he's saying, no, I'm going to show everybody that it's not a failure. I'm going to show people when I restore you and give you this new heart and save the nation, bring you back to your land and make everything right. They're going to see how great and powerful I am. So really, you know, if you boil it down, a uh, dispensationalist at least ought to be motivated by this message that the whole reason you argue for a future for Israel is because of God's glory. That's that's what motivates the dispensationalist to to talk about a future for Israel because that's the way the prophets talk about it. Israel was formed for God's glory and God says it's for my sake, the sake of my holy name, my glory that I'm going to do this. And so Again, scripture is filled with this theme that even when it comes to eschatology, even when it comes to the idea of a future for Israel, all of these themes are wrapped around this overarching theme of God's glory. It's all for his glory. Uh, another another Old Testament aspect that I want to throw in here, which maybe is different than the others, but I, I felt like it was worth mentioning, is the fact that even... Even something as simple as confessing sin ultimately brings glory to God. That's how scripture paints it. And in Joshua 7, 19, you know the story how the children of Israel had just taken the city of Jericho and then they go up to the city of Ai to take it. They fail because Achan had taken something from Jericho. And so that was a sin against the ban. God had forbidden them from taking anything from Jericho. And so... Achan had taken something and caused the sin. And so Joshua finds out that Achan has been selected by God through lots to, to be the one on whom uh, God's wrath has been poured out. So, so Joshua says to Achan in Joshua seven nineteen, my son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him and tell me now what you have done. Don't hide it from me. So notice what Joshua is saying is give glory to God by confessing your sin, telling me what you've done, like show that God is, is right. Give glory to him by confessing the fact that you are a sinner and what you've done is wrong. And I think that that is appropriate. Even when we confess our sins, we are declaring God to be in the right. We are declaring that we are, we are in the wrong. God is in the right we're confessing that, and that does bring God glory. We, we are, in, in essence, telling God that he is perfect, and we have fallen far, far, far from, from that standard. We, we are nowhere near that standard. And so even the Old Testament talks about the idea of sin relating to God's glory. And I think that that's, that's an appropriate understanding that even, even something as personal as confession of sin should be viewed in light of the glory of God. Now, I think sticking with Isaiah, Isaiah is, like I said, filled with this theme of God's glory. We would be remiss to talk about the fact that the fullness of God's glory is found in the incarnation of the Son. And I think that this is this is kind of obvious in, in one sense. It's one of those things that that I think people assume. But I think it's worth talking about because in Isaiah 40, verse 5, uh, in talking about the the future and how comfort will come to Israel and all that, it says, The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, in context there, it's kind of hard to tell just with, with one verse, but in context, 
it seems to be talking about very clearly the future time where there's going to be uh, a a time of restoration for for Israel. For example, the later verses uh, following on in verses nine and following says. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, the herald of good news. Lift it up, say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God, behold the Lord comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. So this is obviously talking about an eschatological time where the the Lord is restoring the fortunes of Israel. Similarly, this is probably identical with the time spoken of Isaiah 35. In Isaiah 35, we're told that the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. So the same phrase there, idea, looking toward the time when you see the glory of God. And when is this going to take place? Well, verse 5, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. So it's really a beautiful thing that is being pictured here. There is going to come a time of just incredible prosperity and joy and gladness and the, the great beauty of all of that is that the glory of the Lord will be clearly seen. And as many commentators have noted, and I would agree, I think that this is a reference to the, the fullness of the glory being revealed in the incarnation of the Son being present. And so I think that that's, that's a beautiful thing. All flesh, everybody will see, will see God's glory at this time. And I think that that's going to be center stage for all the people as as the king reigns and there is there are no more blind there are no more deaf there are no more lame and there are no more mute because the king reigns and you you get to see that glory and so even in the expectation of the fullness of this i think that we would say the the sun reigning fully uh, is a great illustration not a illustration but the fullness of god's glory and so I think it's it's important to acknowledge, and, and everybody does say this to a degree, one or the other, is that Christ is the focal point of Scripture. And as I've mentioned in previous podcast episodes, I would never deny that Christ is the center fo- focal point of Scripture, the, obviously where I have disagreement with some brothers in more of the covenantal circles or allegorical interpretations and whatnot, is that I don't see Christ present in every verse of scripture the same way that they do. But everything is geared toward Christ because he is the fullness, the full representation of God's glory. And so that's what all of history, all of scripture is gearing toward. Okay, so when we think of the story of, of scripture, Christ is the centerpiece. And that fits into this overall theme of giving God glory. And so Christ is the recipient of that. And we look forward to a time where, where this is the beautiful display of the fullness of God's glory. Now, that's essentially almost all Old Testament. I did talk about how Romans 1, basically people reject creation and reject God's glory through that as a manifestation of rebellion. We did talk about that, but I want to talk a little bit about how the New Testament picks up this theme as well and reminds us even why we live and exist. And so if, if you were to even ask Jesus or Paul, why, why are we living? Why are we existing? Why are we obeying the commands of God? What is our purpose? What, what's the whole goal behind these things? Well, I think it's, it's pretty clear. You just survey what scripture has to say. Matthew 5 uh, 14 and through 16, talking about uh, being a light for this world, uh, exemplifying the good works before men. This is what Jesus says. He says in 516, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. So the whole point here that Jesus is pointing out is it's not just, you're not just trying to do good works to, you know, get a badge of honor or even earn a heavenly reward or whatever. Those are all uh, considerations. I mean, I guess not the badge of honor, but 
Matthew 5, 16 really puts the emphasis on the whole point of, of being this light before others and, and manifesting your good works are so that others will give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That's the point. You do what you do in order that God would receive glory. That's how a believer functions. Everything we do, the good things that we do in life, are because we want desperately God to be glorified. Well, perhaps this is no no more well seen than in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, where Paul has the famous verse, and pretty much everyone memorizes it, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I think that's such a great verse. That, that should just be imprinted on our hearts without the possibility of removal. We, we really need to embrace this. It's not, and, and really, uh, the context there uh, is, is a little more narrow, but the principle applies beyond. Uh, everything that a Christian does ought to be done for the glory of God. He gives the examples of eating or, or drinking, but we could expand that to, to anything. For the Christian, whatever we do is done for the sole purpose, or it ought to be done for the sole purpose of glorifying God. You know, I remember studying Philippians 1 at uh, some point in my life and kind of being blown away by Paul's putting together this theme. He's praying for the Philippian believers and he says, it is my prayer that your love, this is verses 9 through 11, he says, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. And that that's a really healthy, helpful prayer. So I want the believers to be filled with knowledge and discernment. And the purpose is so that you may approve what is excellent and you may be pure and blameless, blameless for the day of Christ. So that's, that's Paul's prayer. But notice how this phrase continues here. That's not the end of it. So, so he wants them to have knowledge and discernment. That's what he's praying for them to have that they may be able to understand what it is excellent and that they themselves might be pure and blameless. And in verse 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. That's what he wants for them. He wants them filled with the fruit of righteousness to the glory and praise of God. So in other words, all of this is for the glory and praise of God. Because when a believer walks faithfully with the Lord, shows the change of heart wrought through the Holy Spirit. This brings glory to God. God is, is praised because of the change, because of the sanctification that is present in a believer's life. So it's, it's interesting how once you, once you recognize this theme, it shows up all throughout Scripture. It, scripture is geared toward the glory of God. This is, this is, scripture tells us a story about God and why he is worthy of glory. That's what scripture tells us about. Now, we started off talking a little bit about, uh, well, isn't the Bible talking about salvation? Isn't salvation the entire point of the Bible? And I think that there are some important passages which even relate to that. So if, if our thesis is correct, if, if it's not just about salvation, if, it, if it's about giving God glory, well, how does the Bible talk about salvation? Well, Ephesians 1 talks about the great glories of salvation and how we even have salvation in Christ. You read through Ephesians 1, you're just hit over and over and over ad infinitum of the phrase in him, in him, in Christ. And so you, you understand that our salvation is completely and 100% in Christ. And then toward the end of Ephesians 1, we get into what I like to call the, the goal of salvation, as it were. And in Ephesians 1, 11 to 14, it says, In him we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Okay, notice what Paul is saying there is that uh, the whole purpose of this is that we might be to the praise of his glory. We, the, the whole process of salvation here is resulting in the praise of his glory. And then he goes on in verse 13, he says, In him you also, 
when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So that phrase, to the praise of his glory, shows up here, really emphasizing the fact that salvation is really for God's glory. It's not because God was lonely. It's not because we were good people. And it's not necessarily because even for our benefit, although we obviously benefit from that, but it's for for God's glory. And so Paul even points that out here, saying like, this is all for the praise of, of God's glory. Now, another passage, which I think is perhaps a difficult for us at times to, to handle, but in talking about salvation in Romans 9, Paul gives this, this difficult text, difficult not in the sense to necessarily understand, but difficult in the sense to really come to grips with. And so Paul says in verses 22 to 24 of Romans 9, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. So in other words, Paul is is making the argument that both from Jews and Gentiles, God has, God has, vessels that are prepared for destruction and vessels that he himself has prepared for glory. And both of these are according to his, his will and his pleasure for glorifying himself. And I think that that is, is a element that is difficult for us that God receives glory because he judges people in wrath. And for for us, I think a lot of times we, we think that, you know, God only gets glory when he saves people, but God also gets glory when he judges people because of sin. That may be a hard truth to receive, but it's a necessary truth to receive is that there are multiple ways God receives glory and he's, he's operating according to his will in order to achieve that glory, in order to show himself as just, holy, loving, good, kind. All of those aspects and characteristics of his character are in full display in what he chooses to do. And so we, like Paul, need to embrace that it's not just salvation that gives God glory. It's it's not just salvation that's the entire point of the Bible, but it's emphasizing and highlighting the great and glorious God who created all things and who's worthy of our praise and of maximum glory. You know, this, this theme of, of God being worthy of glory is just found throughout scripture. Once, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And this is why the reformers were so, were so infatuated with this theme, talking about the glory of God, salvation, even being for the glory of God, his sovereignty, uh, demonstrating his glory. This was a this was a theme in the Reformation. We we've definitely lost uh, many aspects of this in our contemporary culture because we tend to make the Bible all about us and what we can glean from it instead of just understanding it and its significance of of who it's about and understanding how great and glorious that is in and of itself. But this was such a common thing in the New Testament uh, in Paul's closing greeting to the Roman church in verses five through seven of chapter 15, he says, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, he, he's praying that they would be unified and encouraged together so that they may live together and with one voice glorify God. That's, that's his prayer. And then in verse seven, he, he adds it again. It says, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. In other words, welcome each other in the assembly. And then he ends it for the glory of God. Welcome one another for the glory of God. You know, maybe that should be our uh, motto in church when you're welcoming one another, welcome one another for the glory of God. I don't think we think about it that way too often, 
but that's what we're that's what we're called to do. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Right? That is that is what we are called to. Even something as basic as embracing one another in fellowship is for the glory of God. You know, I was asked uh, even in class this this last week when do we talk about this? This seems like we don't talk about this in discipleship too often. And I think this needs to be talked about right away. This is such a key component of what it means to be a human being and what it means to be in the family of Christ is that we exist for God's glory. This ought to be a theme that we are repeating and shouting to one another on the, on the rooftops. We want more than anything, God to be glorified and whatever that takes is what we desire. You know, the Westminster Shorter Catechism actually starts with this question. Question number one, what is the chief end of man? And the answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's such a beautiful encapsulation of this basic fundamental truth. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. This is, this is what scripture describes. You know, I had a teacher when I was in seminary and I maybe it was a little before seminary. I can't really remember, but I remember uh, the class that I was in and the, the class was just so amazing, always so encouraging, just learning so much about the Bible. And I, I loved it. I loved that. But I, one of the things I remember is the opening prayer by by the teacher and it was left a mark on me because you knew it was for real this was this was a godly man who who prayed it and he opened up the class in prayer just asking that god would glorify himself he said lord whatever whatever it takes just glorify yourself even if it means killing us do that to glorify yourself i just remember thinking to myself as i was ending the prayer with him it's like I've never heard anyone ask God to kill to kill himself or ourselves if that's what would bring him glory. And that was eye-opening to me because I, I really I really appreciate the full hearted commitment to to God's glory. And sometimes what will glorify God is not what we think we should do or, or how we think we should glorify God. And so that, that really needs to be our foundation of our purpose. We are in this world to glorify God and what a joyous privilege that is. God didn't have to create us, but he gave us the opportunity to exist for his glory. And that that's an incredible privilege. So we started the episode talking about what is the purpose of the Bible or why do we have the Bible? And I think we're able to answer the question as we've kind of surveyed many of these themes and topics. I think we've, we are able to come to the conclusion that, that all of these topics are in the realm of the purpose of glorifying God. And so why do we have the Bible? We have the Bible to teach us about God in order to glorify him. So to end this episode in a typical apostolic fashion, may we all say to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, hope it's been helpful for you. You can always reach out to me through the contact form on my website. You can find that at petergaming.com. You can also check out information on our seminary at shepherds.edu. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you.